this might be a dark way to start a sermon, but be patient. I, I want you to think about something here. Your future obituary. Your life gets summed up in such few words. So what will be said of you? I was talking with a friend not long ago, and he actually said he already wrote his because he wanted to know what was going to be written about him. Who knows you better than you, I guess. Now, while this may sound bleak at first, I bring this up because I I just want to say, and maybe this isn't obvious, what you do with your life matters. What you do with your life matters. Now, before we stay too dark or it gets too dark, allow me to share with you parts of an obituary I came across last year. And, and yes, this is a verifiably true obituary. I made small edits for appropriate sake, and I'll leave it at that, okay? You'll see it on the screen, but really you probably can't see it all that well, so just listen to me as I read it. Born and raised in Kentucky in 1963, Jamie, a divorcee, father, grandfather, and proud owner of a few lots in the trailer park, had had enough uh, and up and died on us on June 14th. As a gluttonous eater of fried foods and snack cakes, as well as the occasional chili cheese dog, Jamie tried in vain to give up the ghost by clogging his arteries and having a stroke back in 2015. On many occasions in his life, Jamie was seen in his backyard at the trailer park during the early hours of the morning, hammering beers, standing over country-style ribs, and yelling, it's got a head like a cat on it, while nearby neighbors would peek out their windows bearing looks of disgust and amazement. Jamie loved his family more than anything else in the world, except ice-cold bush beer, room-temperature bush beer, T-bone steak, New York strip, prime rib, shrimp, swimming, poker, hatchback, Mustang GTs, tank tops, Kentucky men's basketball, and his personal copy of Eddie Murphy's stand-up special, Raw. He leaves behind his second favorite son, Rocky, of Arizona City, Arizona, his favorite son, Rodney, of Science Hill, Kentucky, and an unofficial daughter, Melissa, of the trailer park. He will be moderately missed. Now, jokes aside, your obituary will one day be written about you, and the most important aspects of who you are will rise to the surface. And if we're being honest this morning, most of the things that occupy your headspace today will not be in your obituary. If you think about the words that will summarize the totality of your life, I mean, what if you could actually read those words in advance? Would it actually make you make some adjustments? Maybe bring forward certain priorities that you don't have right now? Because the truth is, you won't be able to read your obituary one day. And so it's important to live a life of significance now. Uh, Now, you can't read your own obituary unless your name is Brad Meltzer. Uh, Brad, he was an author. Uh, He wasn't sick or anything, but he became curious about his future obituary. And so he had a professional obituary writer. You can be anything you want, kids. Uh, He had that person write it up for him. And when he got it, he did not care for what it said because he realized the trajectory of his life, even though he was a New York Times bestselling author, The trajectory of his life was not going where he ultimately wanted it to go. And so before we jump into our text in Acts 26 today, I want you to know what our topic today is all about. And it's simple. It's all about the trajectory of your life. I don't care how old or young you are today. Your life is already going in a direction. It's not that at some point it will, it already is. And your life is on a trajectory now. And the question that Jesus asks today, uh, it, it doesn't just change the trajectory of one person. The question he has, it changes the history of the world. I'll get on, I'll get into that later. But much like the other questions that Jesus has asked these, gosh, 14, 15 weeks that we've been doing this, 
Jesus doesn't ask the question today to get information from the person. And I hope that's been, I hope you realize that's been the case most weeks. Jesus doesn't ask these questions because he doesn't know the answer. Jesus doesn't ask these questions to get information. Jesus asks these questions to transform the person. He asks these questions to shape us, to shift our thinking and to transform us. And so just my little phrase for today, my little catchphrase for today. Today's question isn't about information, but transformation. So let me set the scene for you now in Acts 26. This is our first question that falls outside of the Gospels. And and this takes place well after the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, at this point, he's already ascended into heaven and, and the church is growing. Christianity is spreading all over the ancient world. They probably didn't even call it Christianity at this point in history, but lives are being changed and everyone thinks it's great. Not everyone. Okay, specifically, there's a man named Saul. And Saul doesn't like this Jesus movement at all. He does not like how many Jewish people are now believing in this Jesus of Nazareth. And so Saul and others, they have it in mind that it's time for this Jesus movement to end. And and they began to, to, to round up the Christians, throw them in prison. Saul oversees the execution of Christians. And so we hear that and we think that's obviously bad behavior. That's, that's a terrible thing to do. But please, we got to be on the same page about this. You need to understand this. Saul does not believe he's a bad guy. He does not believe he's doing, quote unquote, bad things. Saul is doing this because he dangerously believes this is the will of God. He truly believes He's doing right by God. And so in Acts 26, Saul, who we now know as Paul, he's looking back on his life and he recounts this moment where Jesus engages him and it changed the trajectory of his life. We're going to pick up in verse 12. You'll see it on the screen. Uh, Paul writes of Saul, if you will, On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. And so Saul, he walks this road to Damascus, and he gets this vision that Jesus reveals uh, himself to Saul, and he asks our question, why are you persecuting me? And now, if you're sitting here this morning, you may be wondering how this question is supposed to relate to us today. Like, Pastor, I think you missed it this week, because all these questions we're supposed to be relatable to us. I'm not persecuting minorities. So how is this supposed to help me? Well, remember, this question that Jesus asks, it is not about information. This is about transformation. And so what what heart change Jesus is pursuing with Saul, that's what we're talking about here, okay? Now, that transformation is our topic today, the trajectory of your life. So he approaches Saul to talk with Saul about the trajectory of Saul's life. Now, to understand what's actually happening, we need to realize that Saul's persecution of the early church, it's connected to this weird phrase. You may have picked up on it, okay? Our question today is, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But did you catch the phrase after that? Jesus says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. All right, I got a picture for you uh, up on the screen uh, of some farmers. Remember, in Acts 26, you have to realize this is an agrarian society, and people farm. And the goad is the long-pointed rod that is used to prod an animal into the direction it was meant to go in. And so to kick against the goads, 
was to resist the movement you were being directed into going. Or if you've ever heard the phrase, uh, I was goaded into it. They goaded me into this. I was, if you will, annoyingly pushed into this. Okay? So that's the idea here. And there is a cultural significance to this, uh, to this phrase, to kick against the goads, because in the Greco-Roman culture, it became a popular metaphor for not resisting uh, the direction of your life, but specifically kicking against God's will. And I, I set all that up to simply say this, and you'll see it on the screen. To kick against the goads is to resist the trajectory God has for you to fight against his purposes for your life. And so this is what Jesus is telling Saul. He says, Saul, you are kicking against the purposes of God. You are literally kicking against the will of God. And as I consider this, I think we would all agree that Saul's actions are reprehensible, right? He's hurting people. He's harming people. He's overseeing their death. But I believe Saul's biggest problem was his motive, how he was motivated, or what we'll call a little bit later his, his ideology. We'll find that out too. Um, now remember, Saul did not believe he was a bad guy. Saul did not believe he was doing bad. He actually thought he was doing the will of God by persecuting Christians. His motive was to honor God. And so Saul's interpretation of God and God's law was to crush the early church. But then Jesus, he confronts him and Jesus corrects him and says, Saul, you're doing the opposite of honoring God. You're contradicting God's will. You feel like you're on this righteous cause. But Saul, this is wicked. I mean, have you ever had a moment where you were just doing what you thought was right, like it was right to you? You never considered another perspective only to be con confronted with some uncomfortable truth, and then realize, I've, I've been wrong this whole time. Not just about having a wrong opinion, but maybe, maybe you've been confronted about something that you believe was fundamental to who you are. I mean, imagine the humility it takes Saul to hear this. I know it's Jesus. I know it's a vision. I know it's amazing and incredible and maybe irresistible. Can we still not discount Saul's humility to hear this and to recognize what I believe about God is fundamentally wrong and I have to change? And that is where I give him so much credit. Now, if you will, Saul is high on the world's most dangerous drug, religious hubris. And his life's trajectory was going in one direction. But then Jesus changes all of that. And again, maybe you're here today and you haven't persecuted minorities like Saul. However, if you are honest, you know you are living aspects of your life in contradiction to God's purposes. If we could go just, just one layer deeper now. Because it's one thing to acknowledge your actions are problematic and, and work against the will of God, you know, as, as Jesus says, kicking against the goads. But it's another thing to concede, wow, my fundamental beliefs about faith or God, my worldview, my, my ideology has been fuel for my actions. See, church, this is what I'm trying to say. Uh, what Jesus is getting at here isn't just Saul's actions. It's not about uh, behavior modification. Hey, Saul, maybe don't do that. Jesus is all about transforming Saul from the inside out. And that, if I could get on a soapbox for a moment, is the difference between religion and Jesus. Because religion will teach us hey, these things are sins, stay away from them and repent when you can't. But here's kind of my issue with just that simplistic understanding of faith. If that's all we believe about faith, you know, sins are here, repent when you can't resist, whatever. 
then who does that place at the center of the story? Me. My, my, my faith is all about me and my effort and how I can go about this. My faith is up to me. And so religion, if you will, kind of religious rule following, if you will, uh, it reduces the beauty of Jesus into just ideology and kind of like Saul of Tarsus here. Saul can justify all sorts of things in the name of his religion. But like I said, Saul's actions are evil, but it's his motivation that's the problem. Jesus is wanting to transform Saul's ideology. That's what must be transformed from the inside out. Because I don't believe Saul wakes up one morning and chooses violence. Saul was primed by religious fervor and what he believed about God and how to live out that creed. But it was this undercurrent, again, of what I'm calling ideology, just just what your fundamental belief about the world. I believe Saul has this undercurrent of this ideology that's behind his actions. And this is kind of where I want to finish with our time uh, here, because it's just as relevant to us today. Uh, Pastor John Mark Comer, he spoke to this recently. And he said, given our uh, current cultural and religious climate, that we live in the age of ideology. Uh, Again, just for simplistic sake, ideology, it's your fundamental belief about the world around you. And so John Mark says, we live in the age of ideology. And that simply means that that this isn't about religion or power structures or government, but it's our individualized or our communal ideologies that are the most influential force in culture today. And while we're not talking about politics, it it does get personified over there, right, On, on the left and right and everywhere in between, but it comes down to ideology. And Jesus seeks to change Saul on this fundamental ideological level. Now, again, I, let's, let's bring it back down to the basics, okay? I don't want to lose you this morning. Remember, Saul, he is motivated to kill Christians, to persecute and, and, and squash this church. Again, not because he believed that it was a bad thing to do. He believed it was a good thing to accomplish And today, I think it's hard for Christians to avoid similar thinking sometimes, especially when certain talking heads on TV, the internet, or if anyone listens to the radio anymore, which you should, uh, but but those talking heads are kind of telling you like, hey, this group of people, they're your enemies, and, and you need to stand up against them and do this, that, and the other. It's this ideological belief that it's us versus them. But church, if I could, Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities. It's against something completely different. And I bring this up because all ideologies, they begin with a truth. But then they make the one thing the whole thing. Be patient with me for a second. Part of the truth becomes the whole truth. And then it kind of gets distorted and it turns into a parody of itself. And so here, here's, here's how we're going to apply this. Okay, Saul has a good thing in mind. I want to honor God. I think we'd all agree, hey, that's a pretty good thing. I want to honor God. But for Saul, he takes a good thing and he makes it the whole thing. And it leads him into areas of life and understanding that, that his faith doesn't even believe in. Or, or maybe more recent history will help here, okay? An easy example from the last century is, is the Russian Revolution. Uh, I got my undergrad in history, so, so buckle up for a second, okay? I, I promise it won't be long, okay? But think of the Russian Revolution, if you don't know. Uh, it started out by an, a man named Marx and, and, and others as they critiqued classism, and they had the, a vision of a society of equality and justice. That's a good thing. The reality is it ended up as the greatest genocide in human history. 
And that's just simple statistics, no slant, no opinion there. That's just what happened. And the desire for human utopia became complete dystopia. Or the century before that, in our own country, what began as a revolution of liberty ended in the largest expression of chattel slavery in human history. Now, that is not me casting judgments or anything against anyone. We, all of us, we are a mixed bag. Atheist, Christian, agnostic, uh, Zoroastrianism, whatever. We're all made in the image of God. And in that, we hold a desire to do good. We, we hold a desire for virtue and love and compassion, along with being fallen, broken sinners. Whatever it is you want to call us, we are walking contradictions. And we all have an ideology that comes with motivation, but without God, we will ruin everything that we touch. That's kind of one of those like core tenets of the Christian faith. Like apart from God, we can do nothing, okay? And so here, you and I, we exist in this tension. And it's pulling us in all these different sort of directions. And the trajectory of your life hangs in the balance. And what we believe, again, ideologically, what we believe It sways us into things that fall outside of the love of Christ. And that is why here at our church, uh, we, we will always preach the truth of Jesus. We will preach the love of Jesus and the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. Those are truths to build your life on. But here's my warning. When Christians hold hands with other ideologies, the beauty of Christ will take a back seat. All ideologies begin with a truth, but they make one thing the whole thing. Or, or, or let me put this another way. You'll see it on the screen. Uh, ideology is when you take a good thing and you make it ultimate. Okay, remember, Saul, he wants to honor God, takes one thing and he makes it ultimate, and he does some terrible things. We look at history recently. Hey, there's there are good things, right? Liberty or or equality or justice, but then it becomes ultimate. Because when you take something good like freedom, justice, equality, politics, or a number of other things, you take something good, but you make it ultimate, it becomes a true disaster because God is not in his rightful place. But we have put him in the back seat for a virtuous cause. Saul persecutes, he battles, and he harms over and over and over for what? Today, we would call it for his ideology, his cause, his motive, his heart, his religion. And essentially, the the problems across all ideologies, they tend to place humanity and its ways, and its moral reasonings, and its autonomy at the center. And didn't I just say that a moment ago? I think religion kind of has a way of placing you at the center of your faith. And, And this is why this is important. Because God should be at the center. Amen? God should be the center of faith. God in His ways. God in His judgments. God in in His judgments of good and evil, and his authority, all of that should be at the center. See, we were created to live in orbit around a good God that loves us, not around ourselves. Now, you may be sitting here thinking like, all right, you're, you're, you're kind of like really stretching this one out here, pastor. Okay, here's where we just make it practical, okay? Uh, pastor Ed Stetzer, uh, he said, Uh, In this decade, people are leaving the greater church. It's not over theology. It's over ideology. I mean, I've been part of churches where maybe leadership reflected a good thing. But eventually, the good thing became the means of discipleship and the lens by which true Christians were elevated And the quote-unquote false Christians were rooted out. 
because when our ideology becomes ultimate, it becomes a disaster. And so instead of Jesus, as a Christian myself, instead of Jesus forming my identity and my ideology, we have a way of forming Jesus around our identity and our ideology. And and Christians on, on any side you want to call it, and political side, whatever side, we're all guilty of this. We live in the age of ideology, and, and the dangers are, are taking just part of a truth and making it the whole truth and, and making a good thing an ultimate thing. And, and, and it all just kind of comes down to this question I have for you. And I asked you this question a couple of summers ago. Uh, let me refresh your memory. You'll see it on the screen. Could ideology be the idolatry of this generation? And this is how it shows up. Let's let's make it very practical, okay? This is how this shows up. If you're thinking, I don't know, man, this is a little too heady. I don't don't know where you're going with this. You're you're doing a sociological study on the church. No, no, no. Think of it this way. No matter what comes up in the news cycle, do you personally feel the pressure to have an opinion on it? And not just an opinion but an ideological opinion that aligns with your quote-unquote tribe? I think ideology is becoming the sin of a generation, yet this problem is not new. It is new to us, but it's not new to the history of the church. We've talked Saul of Tarsus this whole time because it was a problem then, and it's a problem that persists today because we all have an ideology by which we interpret and process people, events, stories, religion, social justice, cultural movements. And while the ideologies of today are new, the temptation to mix the way of Jesus and what the New Testament writers would call the way of the world is ancient. The biggest temptation for Christians is not atheism. I believe it's this this form of ideological idolatry where we just married the way of Jesus with our prescribed ideology. And so what is occurring in our cultural climate today, again, it's not new. For thousands of years, this has been happening. But it is my hope and my sincere prayer that we would see these inconsistencies within ourselves and that we would come back to the way of Jesus that we would come back to Jesus and allow him to change the trajectory of our lives. So again, back to our story. Jesus confronts the religious hypocrisy of Saul, who in in his tradition and in his culture at the time, he had power, he had influence, he was good at what he did. And Jesus confronts him. And he says, this is not the way forward. He, he confronts this. And if you will, he rewrites Saul's obituary. And so I literally ask right now, Lord, do the same for me and my soul. Confront my assumptions, engage my hypocrisy, and renew my mind to your ways. It is my hope and prayer that that is always our hope and prayer. But the temptation, kind of like Saul, the temptation to sink our faith with something else is all too real. Right? We'll take Jesus and America, Jesus and politics, or Jesus and whatever the cause is today. We'll, we'll, We'll lump it all together. And we'll say silly things, right? We'll say like like real Christians believe this, think this, vote this, or real Christians will understand and do this, exactly this, exactly my way. It's always like funny to me how uh, if I ever get thought in thinking that, that always aligns with what I'm thinking. Yeah, real Christians think like me. That's how this works, right? And so uh, I'll give a very, I think, easy illustration if, if, if we're not quite grasping this. Let me give you an easy illustration, okay? Um, 
there are all sorts of streaming services out there to our ultra, uh, ultimate detriment, right? It's kind of like we reinvented cable, didn't we? What are we doing, you know? Um, well, there are ways to bundle your streaming services, okay? Maybe I want Disney Plus with ESPN. and Hey, it comes with Hulu. Awesome. Oh, but I don't want Apple TV or I don't want Netflix. I don't want Max. I do want Amazon Prime, whatever, right? Here's the idea. I pick this. I don't want that. And I think when it comes to faith, I see a lot of Jesus bundling happening, okay? Uh, yeah, give me his Beatitudes, but not his teachings on divinity, not his teachings on, on, on forgiveness. Maybe add in a little Buddha, maybe some mindfulness, some neuroscience. I don't feel like going to church this morning. Instead, I'll do a TED Talk and listen to worship music. We kind of, I know I'm making fun of like caricatures right now, but like, but we all do it, okay? We, we all, here's, here's what I'm saying. Hey, we all Jesus bundle. We all do it. And Saul of Tarsus was a man committed to his ideology until Jesus freed him. So much so, Saul's like, you know what? I'm such a different person. I'm going to drop the S. Let's put a P in there. I'm going to go by Paul now. And Saul's life, again, it was on this certain trajectory until he encountered Christ. And whether you like it or not this morning, your life is on a trajectory. And maybe you're here today and you realize, you know, I've never prayed before. Or maybe it's been a while since I've prayed. Or maybe you've never considered what it means to have Jesus as Savior and Lord. You've never considered maybe the weight of your sin. Or, or maybe how you've bundled Jesus with other things. Listen, I got great news for you. Jesus loves you. Jesus desires to free you. But here's the thing, and this is honestly, I think what gives people a lot of pause, hesitancy, whatever you want to call it. Jesus desires to be Savior. That means He desires to be Lord of your life. That also means Jesus is not in the back seat to anything or anyone else. And as we exist, as Rock Vineyard exists, listen, there are lots of things in the world to trust and love. We exist because we trust and love Jesus. And we invite you on that journey with us. That, that this, this Jesus, who is not some smart teacher or rabbi, or a cool symbol of social activism before his time. No. Jesus is King and Lord over all creation, raised from the dead by God for what purpose? To save sinners. To save you. Today might feel like a fire hydrant of information. Like, wow, we really went on a journey here, Pastor. Go back later this week and listen to it again on half speed or something because I believe Jesus doesn't need more information on you or from you. I believe today Jesus, Jesus desires to transform you and your life and what will be written one day when you are gone. But it requires a humble heart. Again, I said, I give Saul all the credit for having the humble heart to recognize in myself is a contradiction. Something fundamental to the way I view the world is wrong. And I must change. Imagine for a second if you asked the same question. Oh, come on, pastor. I've been walking with the Lord for decades, or I've been at this for months, or whatever. I don't know. Just, just go with me for a second. I asked myself this question all week, okay? Listen, I just want to say, if you think this is some tough preaching, listen, this is me all week long, just preaching to myself, you know, okay? Like, like, I mean, think about this for days on end, you know? Ask yourself that question, though. Is there something I'm fundamentally believing that actually isn't of God? Saul recognizes this vision from heaven. It's Jesus. And he says, Saul, why do you kick against the goats? He's saying, Saul, why are you contradictory, contradicting the will and purposes of God in your life? 
And so here's, here's, here's how we're going to wrap up right now, okay? I have just a little application for you. You can write this down, take a picture of it. All of that, we funneled all of that information right now, okay? Into this. You'll see it on the screen, okay? Uh, your life is on a trajectory. You all agreed with that statement at minimum at the beginning. So I think you're still with me right now, okay? Your life is on a trajectory. However, you have blind spots. I have blind spots, people. You do too. And we need to manage them. Uh, First, ask yourself, how has our sin influenced us into this? For Saul, he was proud, he was religious, he was certain. It's, It's how he's lived his life his whole life. But think of it. How has your sin influenced you into this, into the trajectory of your life right now? Ask yourself this next question. How have we been kicking against the goads? How have how have you, as you understand the will of God, as you understand the purpose of God, is to love your neighbor, to love God, as you understand your life right now, where are the contradictions? Where do those lie? Where have you been kicking against the goads? And the last question. How can we allow Jesus to confront those things within us? Uh, Team, will you join me up here? I'm I'm, I'm getting out of the way. How can we allow Jesus to confront those things within us? See, I think uh, many of us, we, we love the stylistic Jesus that is sitting under the tree Uh, welcomes the children while he's holding a lamb, and he's just so gentle and meek and mild. Uh, And that is, hey, hey, that is Jesus, okay? But that's not the totality of Jesus, because Jesus also desires to free you, and sometimes freedom comes in a confrontation. And so I'm asking right now, Lord, confront some things within me, some assumptions I've made about you, about others, about issues, Confront those things within me and transform me from the inside out. I don't want to kick against the purposes of God, which is to love people, to love him. I don't want to kick against those purposes. So where I am inconsistent, where I'm struggling, Lord, transform me. Church, if you will stand, I'm going to pray and get out of the way, and we're going to go into a time of ministry. Uh, here, uh, this, this, this first song, hey, listen, this is just between you and the Lord, okay? I know it's, it's a little heavier today than, than normal. It's okay, though. I, I think you can, you can do it, okay? I believe the Lord is just moving in this place, okay? And that he is, he's, he's challenging us, if you will, confronting us, okay? So let's just ask the Lord this morning what he has for us. Uh, so Heavenly Father, I just pray right now that we wouldn't get lost. Um, we wouldn't get lost in thought this morning. but that we would be present here and now hearing your voice. I think there are some things within us this morning that we just need to confront. Some inconsistencies, some contradictions, where we say one thing and we act differently. We say we love God, we say we love our neighbors, but we act differently. We're walking contradictions. And we need your grace, Lord. So I pray that we would understand that as you confront us with truth, you are quick to forgive. You are quick to restore. You are quick to love us. So meet us here. Meet us right now. In Jesus' name, amen.